Hey there, this is Tam Pham, founder and CEO of Asian Efficiency, where we help people become more productive at work and in life. And today with me, I have my co-host, Brooks Duncan. How are you today? Well, uh, I struggled to find the recording record button right before starting. So you'd think after 347 episodes, I'd know how to do it, but uh, it's always always something new. <laughs> do we uh, need to create a SOP, a checklist for you? Yeah, maybe maybe a good idea. I should have one on my on my monitor. <laughs> Uh, before we start diving into today's topic, which is all about flow states and how we get into it and how uh, we recommend you start implementing some of the things that we've discovered that make it really easy to get into a flow state. Uh, we always like to start off with our favorite resources as of lately. So we have three of them here today, all related to flow states. And Brooks, I know you have them here listed. So would you mind sharing them in 90 seconds or less? All right. So the first... The first item from the top three list is a book by Mihai Cheek Sent Mihai, and that is called Flow: The Psychology of Optimal Experience. So we would be uh, we would be remiss if we didn't list that as one of our top three, since that is almost the Bible when it comes to this flow topic. And he has a really popular TED Talk as well. So I would start there. Number two is Calm, which is an app that. People think of it as a meditation app, which it is, but it's really expanded over the years to have things like sleep stories and all sorts of like focus, music focus stuff that will help you really get grounded and can help you get into flow as well. So that's number two, an app called Calm. And number three is a app slash service called Focus at Will. And I added this to our top three list because earlier Tan and I were talking and he mentioned that he subscribed to Focus at Will for many, many years. Uh, and that is something that basically adds scientifically proven soundscapes uh, that you can have playing that will help you get into a flow state as well. So we wanted to mention that focus at will, and those are our top three resources. Yeah, we'll have links to all of that in the show notes. So you can always go to theproductivityshow.com slash 347 and go check them out there. If you're listening to us in the app, just swipe and you'll see us linking to the stuff there as well. So let's talk about flow states now. Um, last year, we recorded an episode introducing you to the idea of what a flow state is. So you can find that in episode 314. So again, you can go to theproductivityshow.com slash 314 and check it out there. Um, and we're going to talk very briefly about what that is. But mostly what we're going to be covering today is just how we get into a flow state. So the other episode, we talked about what a flow state is and how you can kind of like think about it and how you can utilize it and what the benefits are. But in this episode, we're going to get into like the tactical stuff, the things that you can do right away to get into a flow state. And this episode is also for you if you want to have practical things you can do on a day to day basis to be more productive and being able to get into flow state instantly is I think one of the best things you can learn. And if you're new to the concept, don't worry. Again, you can reference the old episode where we're going to be sharing some tactical things you can do to implement it right away, even if you don't completely know the science and the, the stuff that works behind the scenes, right? Uh, so next week's episode is all about self-awareness and how to get lots of creative work done. And we have a guest speaker coming on. Uh, his name is Sachit Gupta. So I'm really excited to share that episode with you next week. So be sure to come back next week and check out if you want to learn how to build self-awareness and if you're a creative person, how you can get a lot of creative work done in less time. So, uh, Brooks, uh, for those who are kind of new to the idea of flow states, can you just quickly describe what a flow state is? Yeah, I think flow state is something we've all experienced, but the the term flow state was coined by, again, the psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi in his book, Flow. And it's basically, the, the idea of it is the, the concept of being fully immersed in a task to the point where everything else just fades away. We've all been there. Usually a, another way to look at it is being in the zone. So I'm sure we've all experienced that. And really we dug into this more in TPS 314, like you mentioned earlier. So you can go to the productivity show.com forward slash 314. And that is the base description. The thing is, it's it's easy to say, like we've all been there, <laughs> but how do you get back there? Because uh, we all we all ex appreciate it when it happens after the fact, but what are some ways that we can, we can actually take control and drop into there upon command, hopefully in a perfect world, uh, but just at least be there more often than we would be otherwise. So yeah, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, three ways to get into the flow state. 
Yeah. So the first one is to do the right task at the right time. So this is a very simple concept. Um, but Brooks, when it comes to flow states, one of the things that you and I have kind of internally talked about is just the idea of being able to like flip it on like a switch, right? You don't have to know how a light switch works. You just know if you flip the switch, the light turns on. You don't know have to know what the science is, how the mechanical engineering behind it all works. You just know if you flip it on, the light is on. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to float states. And one of the things that we have uncovered is the first tip here is to do the right task at the right time. If you can kind of get that concept and implement it in your day-to-day -day life, things are going to become a lot easier. So I'm kind of curious, Brooks, how do you implement this concept? Well, it's funny, as I was putting this episode together, or at least starting it, I, I just so happened uh, right before working on the show notes, I came across this Twitter thread by someone I follow on Twitter. Her name is Mo Marie Poulin. Uh, she's, for lack of a better description, she's known as a Notion YouTuber. So the, the productivity tool Notion, she does a lot of YouTube videos on that. And she was actually talking about how she keeps a journal and one of the things which we've talked about multiple times on the productivity show uh, but one thing she does which i thought was a great idea is she keeps track of days that she was in a flow state so she felt that she had been in flow state that day she marks it down in her journal which of course she keeps in notion and so she was going back and reviewing her journal something we recommend as well and she realized that tuesday was the day that is supposed to be her main content production day she realized as she go, went back and re reviewed her journal, she never actually experiences flow state. So her main takeaway from that is that she needed to change the content schedule to align on days when that she needs to be focused, which obviously if you're creating a lot of content, you need it to have a day and a time that supports it and to choose a day and a time when she is able again to flow. And I will link to that Twitter thread in the show notes. So go to theproductivityshow.com forward slash 347. And that, all that is a long way to say that a journal can be a really useful way to help you get into the flow. So if you, if you do keep one, review it periodically. And one thing you may want to consider noting down is whether you were able to get into the zone, whether you were able to get into flow. And then the opposite is true. If you go back and you review, review your journal, do you notice when you mentioned you had focus problems, when you mentioned you, you kind of were in a fog, you know, what else was going on? So looking back, um, we talked about this actually in TPS 301, which is called how we improved our lives and work with journaling. So you can check that out for more details. For me, I found that really, really helpful, this process of reviewing my journal to actually figure out for real when this flow state actually happens because then I can look at what I need to change in order to make that happen. So for example, one thing I realized when I used to work in an office and then for a while when I had to work at a co-working space is I realized I really needed to go in early before any, anyone else was there. And that was my op more, most optimal way to get into flow state was to adjust my working time so I could at least get some flow work before anyone else is there. Uh, so that's one thing that has worked well for me. Um, how about you, Tan? Well, one of the things that I think is really underrated is the whole concept of time arbitrage. So it's the idea that not every hour is created equal. So we all have the same 24 hours, but not every single hour is of equal value. So the simplest way I can explain it is that uh, for morning people, the hours between, let's say, 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. might be the most productive hour of the day because they're most energized, they're most focused. Whereas if they had to do any sort of important or creative work done later in the day, say, 6 o'clock at night, between 6 and 7, even though it's the same unit of time, which is one hour, the, the day or the part of the day where they do it is actually very inefficient or ineffective for them, right? Now, the opposite is also true for night owls. Night owls are typically more creative, more energized later in the day. So their hour of between, let's say, 10 o'clock and 11 might be the most productive hour of their day, whereas between 7 and 8 a.m. in the morning, they might not be creative or energized whatsoever, right? So the point is not that morning people or night owls are productive or one is better than the other. That's not the point. What the point is, certain hours of the day is when you have the most energy and focus. So if you can align 
your most creative work during the time of day when you have the most energy and focus, it makes it so much easier to get into a flow state, right? If I uh, had to do any sort of writing, I typically have learned over the years that I get my best writing done in the morning. Now, I wouldn't typically call myself a morning person. I can definitely wake up early, but I can also sleep in <laughs> when needed. But sleeping in for me is like 8 a.m., right? And so I know that if I get my writing between like anywhere between like 7 and 10 done, I get some of my best creative ideas during that time. Whereas if I have to do anything after like 3 o'clock, my mind is just like, you know, uh, clocked out mentally already and just wants to do other things. And so that's something that I've kind of learned about my life and my lifestyle. And so think about your own lifestyle here as well. What are some of your power hours of your day, right? When are you most creative and most energized? And if you kind of know what they are and you can recognize them, how can you then align your schedule around that so you can do your most creative and important work during those times? And I know some people are already going to bring this up. Tan, I can't control my schedule. I, I don't have time for that. Like someone else dictates my schedule. What can I do in that case? And I, Brooks, I know Brooks, you get that handful as well, uh, that question. So I'm going to just preempt you and say, hey, here's some <laughs> things uh, to consider. Because <laughs> I know we get that question all the time when I bring up this whole concept of time arbitrage. So if you're in a situation where you can't dictate your schedule as much, however, uh, there's some other things that you can control that make it easier to get into a flow state, right? So if you can't work under your ideal times, here are some other things to consider. One is make your environment as enjoyable as possible. One of the things you've probably discovered from being in the zone many times is oftentimes you're in an environment that's very pleasurable. It's very easy to be in. It's not stressful. It's not hectic. Um, if you've ever walked into like uh, a beautiful Zen garden where the design was like super peaceful and very calm, right? Uh, your mind and body just like feel really at ease, right? And really calm and uh, very much like relaxed. And if you can be in a position where your environment is like that too, that makes it much easier to stay focused. So for example, if I had a cluttered desk, it makes it very difficult to get it into a flow state because my mind will just go, oh, there's a post-it note here. Uh, I have a credit card here. I have a bunch of other stuff laying around. It's just pulling my attention, right? Uh, and these are things what I like to call flow antagonists. They're kind of like trying to pull me away from being into a flow state. So I want to remove the flow antagonists as much as possible, whatever they might be in my environment. So the big idea here is just make your environment as enjoyable as possible and remove all the flow antagonists that might be there. And I, and I truly believe that most of us underestimate how much our environment impacts us, right? So how, how much sunlight you get, the music or the silence that's there, the, the design, um, the people that might be there or when there are no people there, the, the setup, the structure. Um, you know, some people might even go to uh, another level and say, you know, they feng shui their, their whole place and take it to that degree, which... I wouldn't go there personally that far just yet, but it is, I do think there's something to having a design place that you know, is conducive to your productivity. We record these episodes live in front of the dojo and our TPS plus members, which is our premium product, premium version of the productivity show where uh, our listeners get episodes a week early and also without any ads. And of course you can also participate in the live stream. And one of our members, Neil Tara, posted a link to Twitter. So I guess this is the Twitter linking episode, uh, a Twitter thread by Joy Clarkson, which I thought was a really interesting analogy. And I'm um, just checking it out. She writes, you are, uh, you are not a machine. You're more like a garden. You need different things on different days, a little sun today, a little less water tomorrow. You have fallow and fruitful seasons. It's not a design flaw. It, uh, what does your garden need today? And if you expect a garden to produce things with the same regularly, regularity and sameness as a machine, you'll be disappointed. And I thought that was a really interesting uh, analogy equating productivity with gardening, which I think is very, very true. So thank you, Neil Tara, for sharing that. All right. Uh, before we move on to the second tip, I uh, just want to remind everyone, the first tip, again, is to do the right task at the right time time. If you can align that concept, it will make things so much easier. So I also want to give a quick shout out to our TPS plus subscribers. So we have an upgraded version of the productivity show called TPS plus or the productivity show plus, 
where you get episodes ad free and a week early, but also you get extra bonus contents that we don't release publicly. It's only available for members. And you also get a t-shirt when you are a subscriber. So if you haven't checked it out yet, be sure to check it out at theproductivityshow.com slash plus. And we want to thank everyone who has signed up so far. So if you haven't checked it out yet, go check out that URL that I just mentioned so you can be become a member as well. All right, let's move on to the second point here. In order for you to get into a flow state and make that really easy, the second thing you want to be aware of is to have a clear outcome and goal. Okay, I'll repeat that one more time. Have a clear outcome, have a clear outcome and goal. Now, some of us, I know, uh, including myself, uh, some of us question things more than others. Uh, we always like to know the why behind something. We always want to know why are we doing this? What's the point behind this, right? If that is you, uh, I think that's something that you want to embrace and really understand whenever you're trying to tackle something, what is the outcome behind all of this? What is the goal and why are you doing this? Because if you don't know what the why is of why you're doing all these different things and all the different tasks that need to be done, it makes it very difficult for you to be in flow because you're having all these open loops in your head. And so the way to kind of like get connected with that is to be emotionally connected to your task and get really excited about the idea of what this outcome or what this goal will do for you. Uh, now, not everything that you will do will have a major why, because sometimes you have to do stuff that's quote unquote boring. But if you can find what the bigger purpose behind it is, it'll make it a lot easier to get into a flow state. So to give you an example, I don't get particularly excited about crunching numbers in Excel spreadsheets, uh, unlike Brooks Duncan, who loves it and is like, a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet ninja. But for me, that's not a particularly fun task. Like every now and then I will have to do it. Uh, however, if I think about what's the why behind some of the things I have to do when it comes to crunching numbers in Excel, I start to think about, like, well, if I get to do this task and by the end of it, I can uncover opportunities to grow Asian efficiency to make a bigger impact on more people, that's really exciting to me. That's a why that I can get behind. And so when I'm crunching numbers, I'm just in the moment not thinking about it, right? And that doesn't get any sort of level of excitement for me. However, before I start, if I start thinking about what's the why behind this, what's the major goal or outcome that I'm aiming for, and I can visualize almost or think about the impact that we can make and the opportunities that we can find to make an impact on the people that follow Asian efficiency, then I get really excited because the reason I started Asian efficiency was to help people, to help them become more productive at work and in life. And if I have to crunch a bunch of numbers in Excel, to make that kind of impact over time, I'm willing to do that because it leads me to a bigger picture, right? Just like um, one of the things I have to do on a regular basis is read hundreds of feedback submissions. And if you've ever done that, you know, oftentimes feedback is not always positive. <laughs> There's a lot of negative stuff as well. And uh, you might get like a hundred positive comments, but the two negative ones will always, are, will always stand out. And those are the ones that always haunt you, right? So those are things that on the surface aren't very energizing, but I know that when I do this and I go through the process, the why behind all of this is that I can find hidden gems or insights that no one else will find that allow us to serve our clients and our readers in a way that is non-existent right now. And that to me makes a big difference. And so that then that picture, that outcome is much more exciting to me. So Sometimes I will actually book a hotel room and go through hundreds of submissions and Brooks can testify to this where I'll just literally stay on a Saturday somewhere in a hotel room, again, making my environment as enjoyable as possible to go through all of this, uh, knowing that I'm, I'm doing something that will make a bigger impact on the readers and clients that we have. People who are watching this on the live stream probably saw me perk up when you said Excel. Did, did somebody say spreadsheet? Woo. <laughs> um, yeah, and the the why is important and also the clarity is important as well. Like for example, 
one of the things, and this is something we've really doubled down on in the past year or something like that, because we realize what a big impact it has is in our task, our shared task management system, which for us is JIRA, we made a rule that each issue needs to have a definition of done and an acceptance criteria. And the reason for that is because you have that clear outcome. So before, before I start a work session, I go back and I review like what, uh, what is the definition of done? How will I know that, that this is done and what I'm working towards? And also like what needs to happen for this to be accepted is what we call in our terms. And by having just this, this really clear sense of what it is that I'm doing, uh, leaving aside the why, which is also very, very important, but the, the, like the clarity just really helps me stay moving and not be sidetracked when other things that might be, you know, nice, might be helpful, uh, come up. But if it's not part of that clear, um, end goal, then I know that's what I need to focus on and can kind of look at the other things later. So pairing the the why of the outcome with the clarity of the goal is a, a powerful one-two punch for getting into a flow state. So again, that is tip number two here today to have a clear outcome and goal. And ideally, you know the why as well. All right, let's move on to tip number three here. And that's the last one for today. And that is to create a flow ritual. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier is we are big believers of the concept of flow switches. And it's just the idea that, again, if you can flip a light switch and the light turns on, you don't need to know exactly how it works. As long as you know that you flip the switch, things will go in motion and you know that the light goes on. So the same thing is true for flow states. There are certain f switches that you can turn on that allow you to get into a flow state. And we kind of mentioned it here and there before. However, what we want to do now is kind of give you a flow ritual that allows you to get into a flow state. Because one of the things that we've uncovered is that you can create a ritual that allows you to get into a flow state. So one of the simplest examples is a morning routine. Because when you think about a morning routine, what it really is, it's after you wake up, you go through a set of steps, right, that allow you to set yourself up for a productive day. And that could be things like meditation, journaling, exercising for some people. Uh, everyone has a slightly different variation of it, right? Depending on your life and circumstances. However, the whole purpose behind all of this is to set yourself up for a really productive day. And if you've done a morning routine, you allow yourself to be in a flow state whenever you need it. However, if you skip the morning routine and you kind of start your day, you know, on a groggy note, you're not really sure what you're trying to do that day there's all these flow antagonists appearing out of nowhere that will try to pull you away, that will try to distract you and make it so much easier to focus and get into this flow state that we're seeking, right? So uh, Brooks, what are some examples of flow rituals that you have in your personal life? Yeah, for me, uh, it's pretty much standard. Uh, I always want to have a full uh, a full glass of water. I have this specific mug that I use. I also want to have a full coffee or green tea or peppermint tea if it's later in the day. I like, I'm just weird. I like having a, a room temperature and a, a hot beverage, both uh, alternating. So team uh, AE team members know this because when we're on meetings, sometimes I'll take a sip out of one. Sometimes I'll take a, I'll like rotate. I don't know why I just do. Uh, but also uh, I also have specific flow music that I listen to. So it might be the Westworld soundtrack. It might be Hawaiian folk music sometimes, uh, instrumental but I have specific focus music that I use. And once I have those three things, uh, it's almost guaranteed, unless some other disruption comes up, almost guaranteed I'm going to get into flow. And I actually experienced the opposite of this earlier this week, actually. So it's funny we're at recording this episode is I was writing a newsletter. And usually for me, writing newsletters is no problem at all. But for some reason, I just could not get into it. And I, and I don't know why I was just like really struggling to start. And then I realized I had forgotten to play music for whatever reason. Uh, maybe I had gone upstairs and then forgot to restart it. And once I went into my Sonos and started my flow playlist, uh, then it was, uh, my brain is like, like you said, the flow, the flow state switches. My brain was like, yep, time to, time to go now. And, uh, and it, it really helped. And so those three things, water, hot beverage, and flow state music, uh, and specific soundtracks, uh, work really, really well for me. I think we all have these switches in our lives and 
uh, part of it is recognizing what those are, but also the big idea here is that you can cultivate them. You can actually create them for yourself. I know some people, uh, close friends of mine, they cannot work out unless they play music because that allows them to get in the zone. And for me, uh, the morning ritual is like the biggest thing for me. If I get my morning ritual done and I consistently follow it, I typically have like really productive days. But if I skip it, I know typically my day is not as productive as it could be. So that's an example of uh, a flow ritual that I have. Another thing that I do um, is I have like kind of like a routine where I create my beverage before I start writing. Now, I used to use caffeine, which obviously you can find in coffee or tea, but um. Uh, until earlier this year, I was a big tea drinker and now I started drinking coffee for the first time in my life, which I know is shocking for many of you who have been listening to the podcast for a while. But I had this ritual where I would make my own matcha tea in the morning. And um, by the time I was done with my ritual of making the tea, I felt really focused and I felt really in tune. And oftentimes I would do my writing then. And it wasn't necessarily that I needed the tea or the caffeine to get focused. Uh, sometimes what would happen is by the time I was done and I sat my tea down and I started writing, I actually didn't even drink my tea. I just started writing. And oftentimes um, I got to the point where it wasn't necessarily the tea or the caffeine that I needed to focus or to get into this flow state. It was just the ritual of making the tea of like, you know, getting the powder, mixing it up with warm water, making sure it's the right temperature, right? Smelling it, making sure it tastes good. Like it was that whole ritual that allowed me to go into this really relaxing state to say, Hey, uh, now is the time to get some writing done. And so it started off by thinking that I needed the caffeine, but what I ended up discovering was I just needed a ritual to kind of get me into the state. And that's how we kind of came up with the idea of a flow ritual. So there's other things you can do, like focus music, like Brooks kind of mentioned, like uh, Focus at Will is a big player that we really like. Uh, Brain.fm is another one. And uh, like I mentioned, you can make your own boost beverage, like I just talked about, right? So it's the idea of like make your own tea or make your own coffee. And you can even add stuff in there that make it easier to focus, right? So you have all these different supplements uh, that you can add in or creamers that make it easier for your brain to focus and uh, depending on what type of supplementation you add to that. Uh, which is something we cover inside our dojo much more and in private matters. So those are some of the things that you want to consider. And uh, the big idea, again, behind tip number three here is you want to create your own flow ritual. Okay. And if you can do that, that will make it a lot easier to get focused. So uh, Brooks, we're coming to the end of the episode here. And uh, if people are all the way to the end and they're like, Brooks, Tan, really love this contents. Uh, what's the next step that I should take? What would you tell them? Yeah, well, uh, it's funny. Emily in the live stream says, a flow state ritual makes complete sense. As closely as I follow my morning ritual, I can't believe I don't have a flow state ritual. And so what I would say is of the three of the three strategies we talked about, are any of them missing from your flow ritual? Do you have a flow ritual? If you don't, just Try out something, test it out for a week, pick one of these options, see if it makes a difference and keep experimenting new strategies until you've, you've unlocked it, you're reliably able to get into flow because it's going to be different for each person, but we suspect at least one of these, if not all three, but at least one of these is really, really going to help you out. Uh, we have the show notes at theproductivityshow.com forward slash 347. So everything we we talked about including those Twitter links and stuff like that will be on those show notes and a reminder next week we are going to be talking about or Tan is going to be talking about self-awareness and creative work with our guest and you can always if you need a productivity boost you can always go to the productivityshow.com forward slash quiz and take our productivity quiz to find out where you should narrow in on so thank you so much for listening and we will see you next Productive Monday <laughs>